Hi everyone. Sorry about the um, mix up with YouTube Live. They changed some settings and uh, there was some software that was not allowing us to do this. So um, this is being recorded though. So if any of you, if, if we go over a little bit, you'll be able to get a recording. So I'm going to do it in the speaker view. I'm going to pin my video. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining. Okay. Okay, since we're a little bit late, I'm so sorry about the YouTube, and I'm sure I'm going to get confused and upset emails <laughs> later on about this, but I hope people can find that link. Um, this is more intimate anyway, so you'll be able to talk to Jonathan directly, who's here with us. Um, let me just say hi. My name is Vicki Johnson. I'm the, the founder and director of ProFellow.com, and I'm really pleased to have a special guest with me today, Jonathan Lynn Davis who has a really unique story about how he went about getting funding for graduate school for his master's, his dual master's degrees. Um, I'm gonna just give a quick overview. Jonathan is, um, he was an, a McNair scholar uh, during his undergraduate degree at Texas Christian University. Um, and he's now a management consultant, also does research consulting. And he's here to tell us a little bit about his experience in graduate school and his path toward figuring out how to fund and make the most out of his graduate school experience. So I'm going to pin Jonathan here so that his face is showing and he can hi. And I'm going to probably, if you are uh, just coming in, uh, please mute yourself. I'd really appreciate that just so we don't have feedback. So it's just me and Jonathan being able to speak. Um, Jonathan, hi. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about everyone. yourself, because um, we'd be interested to know, what did you study in undergrad, and uh, what did you do afterwards that set you on the path toward graduate school? Absolutely. So uh, again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jonathan Davis. I completed my um, undergrad in bachelor of science in uh, political science and statistics at Christian University in Fort Worth. Um, during undergrad, Sorry. During undergrad, I participated in a national. Sorry, everyone. Please put your um your uh phones on mute if you can. Thank you. We had every top profiler in the business come through here, every single one. I'm gonna try to get to unmute them all. Sorry about that, John. <laughs> so pardon me if I'm a little skeptical of your profession. Okay, someone is um. investigation focused. And on track. I'm sorry, I can't figure out who's, um... Okay. Sorry about that, John. Go ahead. Alright, so I participated in a national program called McNair Scholars, which prepares undergraduate students for um, graduate research, graduate school, and uh, eventually PhDs. Um, th through that program, I learned a great deal about kind of the graduate process as an undergraduate. Um, visiting schools, doing research, um, meeting with professors, and it was a great experience because undergraduates in general, and I'll say especially for me, me being um, a first-generation college student, um, neither of my parents um, or anyone in my immediate family had uh, gone to college or obtained a degree, it's, it's not something that um, the, this process of, you know, like graduate school and obtaining funding and all these things, like they're really, there's very few avenues for kind of understanding and recognizing the process and how to go about it. It's not a step-by-step -step process. Um, there's ways to like recognize and understand, um, but there's really not kind of a streamlined um, process for, for doing so. And so it really helped me kind of gain the knowledge to be able to go about it. And so for me, um, I kind of had a, a head start, you know, in terms of preparing myself. So I started visiting, visiting graduate schools from my sophomore and junior year in undergraduate, um, visiting places, you know, across the country, um, as well as uh, a couple of other places outside. So I visited anywhere from um, Virginia Tech to Florida State, um, University of California, University of Texas, and like London School of Economics in the UK. Um, and what it what I learned, I'd say the, the biggest thing that I took away from that is most of the ways in which you can obtain funding um, or improve your chance of getting accepted into colleges are by developing relationships with the people who make those decisions. Um, and you can't do that um, 
simply applying to uh, graduate schools. So by simply filing your application, um, you may certainly be accepted, but you, you, you miss out on a lot of the opportunities that are otherwise available. Right, right. Why did you choose the University of Texas to do the programs, uh, the Master's in Public Policy and the Master's in Public Administration? Sure, so I told myself, um, my senior year that uh, okay sorry first and foremost i just i told myself that i was going to graduate school certainly but that i, I wasn't going to pay for it somebody else was going to pay for it um, and it certainly wasn't going to be my parents so i was going to find a way for the institution that i went to to pay for my um, graduate degree or through some other means and so I, for, for my program, and you know, I went into a public policy, public administration program. Um, so I, I chose, I think like um, of the top 25 programs, I applied to like four or five of them, something like that. Um, and I was admitted to four of the five. And there were two of them that were granting me, you know, full, a full ride essentially. Um, one of which was going to pay for, you know, all of my tuition um, and fees. And the other one um, was going to pay for all of my tuition and fees and provide me a stipend. Um, and just really quickly, stipends are a way that graduate schools entice what they consider to be like highly qualified um, applicants, where they're essentially paying you to go to graduate school. Um, sometimes there you just are issued the money it could be any amount of money between say like I don't know twenty and forty thousand dollars over the year um, Which may come with a requirement to do something like a research or a teaching assistantship um, And in some cases sometimes it might not require you to do anything in my case It didn't require me to do anything additionally for the University of Texas Which meant that I could accept that money and also take um, a research assistantship or teaching assistantship and also be paid an additional stipend Mm. Um, sorry, and back uh, the last thing in regards to the program, um, University of Texas, the LBJ School of Public Affairs is you know it's a top it's a top ranked program. Um, it was founded by and you know named after one of our former presidents, obviously, um, and it has a lot of clout in you know my particular field, um, especially in Texas, um, especially in Texas and in the Southern United States. And it was a program that I felt would be able to provide me a lot of uh, background in my field and would help me prepare and excel um, in the fields of like public policy and government. Awesome. Now, when we first spoke, you know, you had this unique story that, you know, through the McNair Fellows Program, you had some funding for graduate school already, but then you went out and sought more funding. Um, what sort of prompted you to do that? Because I think some people might think, well, I've got this, so I'm, I might not go that next step. I mean, what, what were you thinking? What was going through your mind when you, that, when you went out to look for more? Sure. So the kind of preface for that, uh, one of the things that I research, because I do a lot of academic research, um, one of the things that I research is institutions. So I research how uh, institutions operate and the, the kind of the, the, the symmetries and, and recognizing um, you know, conditions and a number of things. So what I found first and foremost from my fellowship is that it stated that, um, you know, we're, we're providing you X amount of dollars and it is not recommended that you necessarily have an additional job. And I remember I went and I asked um, one of our deans, it's like, it's not recommended. Does that mean that we can't have a job? It was like, well, no, it's just not recommended. It's like, so we can have a job. It's like, well, yes. Like, all right, well, I'm going to do that. Then. Um, and my kind of philosophy for jobs in general, but especially in academia, is that um, I apply to the places I want to work. I'm less concerned with whether they have job openings um, because like academic institutions are really kind of finicky in terms of how they utilize their funding. In general, institutes and centers and professors, like uh, tenured professors, the general rule is they have a lot of money. Um, it's really a matter of where and how they want to use that money. And so just because they haven't hired, say, graduate research assistants or teaching assistants before, it doesn't mean that they won't. It just depends on the opportunity that presents themselves. Um, so the, there's this institute that I was kind of aware of even before applying, um, uh, Institute for Urban Policy Research Analysis at UT um, that does um, 
you know, policy and research in regards to mostly local and state governments and stuff like that, um, which is something I was really interested in. And I noticed they didn't have any graduate research assistance, um, which didn't concern me, but what in recognizing that the professor that led the institute was a tenured professor, I knew that he was, you know, that he was able to and had the clout to be able to hire those positions. So I essentially sent kind of an informal application that included like my research and background, a resume. I provided, um, you know, my, my general availability as well as why I thought that I would be a good fit. And in a couple of weeks, I received a call. Um, it was kind of funny. I received a call first telling me, it's like, you do realize we don't have like graduate positions, right? It's like, yes. And they said like, okay, well, why do you think, why do you think that, you know, you would be able to be like our first? And I, I just said, you know, because of X, Y, and Z, because, you know, I do this kind of research and coalesces with yours, I, you know, um, et cetera. And then a couple of weeks later, it's like, okay, well, we might be able to work this out, but we need to talk to, you know, we need to talk to this person, this person, this person. And after about a month, I got a formal offer. Okay, um, wait, wait. So let's, let's back up here. So you sure. look, so there's a, there's a few key table, takeaways from this one you sort of sniffed out where you think funding exists inside the university. Mm -hmm. um, and so you were sniffing out that the tenured faculty often have these pots of funding and as well as like these research institutes that are within the university right. can have their own sort of discretionary funding. And then the second part of that was that you were pitching yourself to an organization that didn't have any open job positions or assistantships. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, you're writing your letter. Um, wait, let's go back to the first part. How, how did you know uh, where this funding might exist, these secret pots of funding? Um, and where, how could other students sort of sniff out that at their own universities? Sure. So a couple prefaces is, for one, I mean, the University of Texas, um, the University of Texas at Austin is, you know, it's a tier one university that generally has a lot of money. Um, there's uh, tier one universities, and there's a list, you can look up tier one universities. It's like basically the, um, the 200 wealthiest universities in the United States. Um, there's no question of how much, there's no, there's never a question of how much the university has in funding it's a matter of where they decide to distribute it um to uh it's just in kind of recognizing the kind of professorial track so there's there's a couple of different kinds of um people that teach at universities you have lecturers followed by assistant professors followed by associate professors followed by professors and that's also like the tenure track the only thing that's really important in understanding that is that order is basically you know, what how much the university values them um, it also tells you how long they've been at the university, which also tells you generally um, how much money that they have. Tenured professors, um, the ones that I've had experience with um, at tier one universities will have hundreds of thousands of dollars in um, discretionary funding. And so this is an, in addition to whatever other things that they're actually doing in research, but they'll have hundreds of thousands of dollars that they can spend on pretty much anything that they find worthwhile. Um, and so there's a there's obviously a minority of those on a campus. Um, the vast majority of professors uh, won't be quote unquote professors. They'll be assistant or associate or lecturers. Um, the other thing is that centers and institutes um, will have funding too. So like uh, mine was you know the Institute for Earth Policy Research Analysis. You'll have every university will have different centers and institutes about anything. Um, the the biggest push if you're able to find a professor whose actual title is professor who directs or oversees an institute, they have money. There's, there's no question of it. Okay. Again, it's, it's a matter of what they decide to use it on. And so I was able to find an institute that was run by a professor, not associate, not assistant, but a professor. And so I knew that it was a matter of, can I convince, can I convince him you know, to hire me for this position? Because like, I know he has the money. Like the money is there somewhere. Uh, but it's like, is he willing to? Um, and so that was kind of like my like philosophy and approach to it. Um, and another thing that was well helpful in my case is that the um, sometimes professors are reluctant to hire um, graduate research assistants and teaching assistants because those positions pay for your tuition at tier one universities. Graduate research assistants they pay you a stipend of whatever they decide to pay you, but they also pay for your tuition. And the tuition, um, depending on your university, is often more than the amount that they would actually pay you. And right. so from their perspective, your salary, say if you were getting a stipend of $20,000, 
uh, a year or something like that. Um, and you're at a private university. I didn't go to a private university for a graduate, but say you're at a private university like, I don't know, Emory. Um, your tuition is a lot more than $20,000. Um, and so in my case, because my tuition was already paid through a fellowship, um, it was a lot more enticing because I remember when I got to the conversation about salary, I felt like there was kind of a side. It's like, okay, well, how much are you expecting to get paid? You know, um, how many, how many hours are you taking in classes? It's like, well, actually, you know, I have this fellowship, so you don't have to worry about how many hours I'm taking because you're not going to be paying for it. It's like, oh, okay, great. So, right, right. You no, know, then like the negotiation process for salary became much different because, you know, about a third of the overall compensation would have been tuition. And so that kind of got taken off. And it also paid for like health and, you know, other kinds of like fees and benefits and things like that. But it opened up more negotiation for things like salary. Well, see, that's good to keep in mind. I mean, that that they have to consider a sort of basically it's an overhead cost for them that they have to cover your tuition in addition to your and maybe other even things like health insurance or there might be other kind of overhead for having your position. But, um, right. but they were open to it. So even though they didn't know that you had that. You didn't put that in your letter when you were writing to them that you had this? I did, I did. Well, the thing is, um, I did put that I have the fellowship, but I didn't put in the fellowship. It's like, oh, they're also paying for my tuition. They're doing X, Y, and Z. Right, right. The general thing is like a lot of things are named fellowships that don't necessarily mean one that you're even getting money. For example, I have another fellowship at UT that wasn't paying me. It was called a fellowship, but it wasn't um, one that paid me necessarily. And okay. it was like a, um, a research trainee fellowship. So. Fellowships don't always mean that they're paying for really anything or tuition or anything in particular. So it's hard to tell sometimes unless someone recognizes what that actual fellowship is. Okay. But one last thing that I'll preface that's really important is, and again, for tier one universities, which like, there's a number of them, but anywhere from like University of Georgia, Berkeley, California, NYU, UT, um, those kinds of universities, um, you have to be working a minimum number of hours in order for them to pay your tuition. Okay. Uh, and from what I can tell, it's always about 20 to 25 hours. Um, so say if you're taking nine hours in graduate classes, um, you have to work 20 hours for them to pay for those nine hours in graduate classes. Mm -hmm. If you work 10 hours, they'll still pay you, but they won't pay for your tuition. So let's get into the pitch. So you went to this research institution that was headed by a professor. So you had this hunch that they had money. And you were also interested to work there because of the topics of what they were working on. Right. Um, but again, they didn't have any posted assistantships. And, and in fact, they had never hired an assistant. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you go about approaching them about jobs? Was it sort of like, hey, I want a job. Like, what do you got? Or was it like, uh, yeah, tell us how you went about that to be strategic. Sure. sure. So the two years between my undergrad and, and grad, um, I worked as a, as a director of an agency in, in Fort Worth in Texas and um, in managing people, I, I, what I've recognized, not just for me, but for anyone is that most ideally you want, um, most ideally you want to hire people that can supervise themselves, that recognize what's needed in an organization, um, that are, you know, like uh, individually ambitious and don't require a lot of supervision. And so I kind of carry that philosophy in to this because what I imagined was the case and I was right what I imagined was the case is that you don't want to hire because graduate research assistants like th these are like adults like these aren't like 18 year old kids like you know in undergrad stuff like these are these are adults that for the most part um, probably have some professional experience you don't want to hire a graduate research assistant that you're paying for tuition that you're paying for you know that you're additionally paying in health and all these other costs you don't want to baby them you don't want to have to introduce them to new concepts and do all these other kinds of things. And so what I did is, you know, I basically overviewed. It's like, okay, um, you know, I'm applying for, you know, this position. I know this is what your research, your research institute does. I've read these three research briefs that you've, that you've done. And it's kind of, it's similar to things that, you know, that I published or that I've worked on. I have this professional experience in government and policy, um, you know, and kind of in summation all in all, I believe that I'd be a perfect fit, that I'd be able to start quickly, that I would require like limited, you know, limited supervision, and that I recognize like your rules and policies and, and your kind of, um, you know, your organizational philosophy. So I did my best essentially to make it easy for them to look at my application and say, okay, we're not gonna need to spend a ton of time um, in order to like train and supervise and oversee this person. They're gonna be able to pick up, um, pick up most of the things pretty quickly. 
And so oh, that's incredibly smart. And I want to reemphasize that you said that you took the time to kind of link in there. Hey, I've read some of your reports. I know right. what you're working on. So this isn't just like a cold generic email, like, I'd love to work for you. What do you got? You know, you really took the time to tailor those messages, right? With that you read their reports, you know what they're working on. Mm -hmm. And usually what are these research institutes? What are their goals? When are they, is it publications? Is it projects, consulting? It, it varies really, really drastically. So first of all, there's, I mean, so I'll just, over, I don't know, this might've been one of your next questions, so I might be answering another it's question. It's okay, no worries. Yeah, it kind of relates to, it kind of relates to this. So um, first of all, there's a couple of different kinds of, so all of these kind of fall into assistantships. So you have graduate research assistantships, which you're, you're working with a professor or an institute to do research. And that could be publicizing uh, or publishing, sorry, publishing individual research, um, you know, for yourself with their assistance. Um, you could be just assisting them with their research, um, some combination of the two. Um, there are teaching assistantships, which I don't talk too much about because I've never had a teaching assistantship, up, but I know a number of people that do. And basically that is you're helping to teach a, a, a course, an actual course. Um, graduate research assistants don't help with courses. Well, they might help with maybe curriculum or something, but they're not teaching anything. Um, whereas teaching assistants are teaching actual classes. We have to be there during the classes, et cetera. Um, the, the last one, which, um, the last one, um, is a graduate assistantship. It's more broad. And usually those you're assisting with programs. You're assisting with like a particular like, you know, programs or events or different kinds of things like that. Um, I have most experience with graduate research assistantships, obviously. Um, but in general, like it varies really drastically because you could have a graduate research assistantship with the law school in which you're assisting with developing briefs and, you know, case studies in relation to, you know, whatever courts, um, or, or judicial research the law school is working on. You could be a graduate research assistant for um, like, uh, I have friends in like, you know, like they're in like biological sciences that are literally doing laboratory work. Um, mine has been more kind of policy, you know, more policy research oriented or social science research oriented. Um, mine didn't require me to publish anything. I was able to publish three, um, um, three pieces of research while I was there, but it wasn't a requirement. But at the same time, my position didn't exist anyway. So like, it kind of goes along with that. Um, so it, it, it varies really, really drastically. Um, in part, depending on the field, like engineering GRAs, I can't even tell you what they do. I imagine it's very different than what, than what I did. Um, but it varies really drastically. And, and it's something that you really, that's, that's another reason why you have to understand very specifically the, what you're actually applying to. Right, right. Um, and I'll add kind of along with that. So in my opinion, the best, like, you know, my, in my opinion, the, the most structured, you know, GRAs, GAs um, are with institutes and centers. Um, but it's not to say that you can't get those with professors themselves. Because again, professors have their own money and a lot of professors have their, um, their own um, GRA. So like one of the professors um, uh, that I had for a class at UT, uh, I remember I took a class of his, it was on, it was called political sophistication, which is a really interesting concept that I'm not going to get into. Um, and I remember after the class, I was looking up, I was like, well, I want to learn more about this. And I found out that he was actually the one that invented the concept in the eighties. Uh -huh. um, and so he has like his own center basically on himself. Um, and he has like 14 GRAs that are just for him. Wow. Um, literally 14 GRAs, um, but, you know, and, and, and he has more in relation to his center. Um, so it's really, it's really about like following, you know, the money, mm -hmm. I would say, which is, you know, in part with professors and in part with like centers and institutes. Um, and I guess like, you know, developing a plan and, and recognizing, you know, what their needs are. That's the biggest thing is recognizing what their needs are. Um, because sometimes they might not necessarily know. Because, you know, for, for the one that I applied for that never had GRAs before, their question was, it's like, well, you know, what, what would you even do? And it wasn't a rhetorical question. It was, you know, we don't know what you would do. So can you tell us what you would do? <laughs> no, and this is smart too, I think, especially if you're pitching um, an assistantship that doesn't exist or a pitching to an organization, did you think at all strategically about what you should do that would help you kind of post grad school? You know, cause you didn't go after teaching stuff maybe because I mean, if, if you are somebody that wants to go into academia or teaching, then maybe a teaching assistantship is the right one to go after versus a research or other more kind of programmatic one. 
Did you think about that at all when you were kind of making your pitch or? I, I did. So I applied for, well, I didn't apply for any teaching assistantships. Um, I was more interested in doing actual practical policy research. My field specifically is like quasi academic. It's like, you know, quasi academic and quasi professional versus say like a program like, well, most PhDs, my minor masters, for example, but like most PhDs, um, they even require teaching assistantships and things like that. Um, I figure when I get to that stage, I'll do that anyway. Um, but in general, teaching assistantships are a little more regimented, um, regimented in the way that you have to be there when they're teaching the class, for example. Mine was um, really flexible in that I had to work a certain number of hours, but they, for the most part, didn't care when I was there. Um, you know, like it was, you know, it was maintained, but like I could work, you know, the 20 hours in, you know, in three days and five days. Sometimes I could go in on weekends and things like that. And teaching assistantships, I just didn't feel um, coalesced very much with what I wanted to do because I wanted, you know, to do research on like, you know, institutions of practice and stuff. And, you know, teaching assistants, you have to find specific classes um, that you have experience in. Um, so that's another thing. Teaching assistantships, I think, I think you generally have to have more experience um, with the academic course load of whatever that thing is. Like if you want to teach psychology, you couldn't have just taken a psychology class. Like you would have probably had to have like a degree in it and several advanced courses and stuff. Whereas the GRAs, um, they're like the GRAs are more like actual jobs, like actual jobs in the sense of do you have experience in this thing, whether it's academic and or professional. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking of like, you know, th say you already have like your degree and you're done. It's like, would you be able to get some kind of, you know, job there in that way? Um, and so that's kind of the way that I looked at it. But in, in all, you, you kind of have to look at the, these very individually. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't treat it like, say, like Indeed, like Indeed.com. Like you can't just, just ship out, just, um, you know, copied applications everywhere because they'll figure it out very quickly. And, you know, they're looking at all this, like you said, the overhead and everything is like they're not going to pay a combined what honestly is probably you know forty to fifty thousand dollars a year at a public institution and they're not going to pay all that for some random student that is interested in something they're not looking for people who are interested they're looking for people who are who are experienced who are invested and who have like a, a vision and plan yeah and i also want to tack onto this because sometimes students ask sometimes in their pitch they'll talk about um you know, financial need. Well, I need this job financially, yeah. but I, I sometimes I think that's a mistake because they're not going to, right? They're not going to pick you just because of your financial need. Right. Yeah, that's actually, that's really important. So I, I've, I've had a couple of people that I've talked to recently. Um, they don't care about your financial situation. Um, the, the, the college and university might in terms of like your, you know, you being admitted and looking at like need-based scholarships and stuff. But in the end, TAs, GRAs, GAs, these are jobs. Um, and they want the best people for those jobs, which is another, which is and something I didn't say, which I should have said earlier is, which is why they'll take anyone that fits those positions, regardless of what the department they're in. So for example, like for mine, for the, the Institute of Urban Policy Research Analysis, it wasn't even, although it was policy, it wasn't even in a part of my college. It was a part of the College of Liberal Arts, which is an entirely different college. Um, and but they noticed that like I fit the skills that they needed so they took me over someone that may or would have applied in that college and which is why for example if you come in like say with a law degree you might be able to be um, a research assistant for like for policy or for government or economics or anything um, all in all they want the best the best fits for those position and they don't care about your economic situation um, they care about getting you know from their because from their perspective it's like how are you going to help me are you going, how are you going to help me get my work, you know, published? How are you going to help us manage our programs or events? How are you going to teach? How are you going to help teach this class? And they're not thinking about your financial situation. It's just completely irrelevant um, in relation to applying for those positions. Again, that might be something to, you know, talk about on your application um, to a graduate program, maybe, um, but not in relation to these because they're jobs. No more than if you were applying to a job at like American Airlines. It's like, hey, I really need this job because I haven't been working in a while or something, something. They don't care. Yeah. Okay, so I got some really good key takeaways so far. One is that um, the assistantships, number one, can help pay for both tuition and give you an annual stipend. So that's a significant amount of money for graduate school. You right. can do it at the master's or doctoral level. Mm -hmm. But secondly, the biggest takeaway is that these are jobs 
-hmm. technically for the university. And so you need to pitch yourself like you would in an interview. So they're not going to pick you based on financial need. Mm -hmm. They're not going to pick you um, even just because you're from that college. They're looking for the best people. Mm -hmm. So you really need to tailor your application, your approach for each opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then um, also what I liked is that, you know, just kind of drawing on your strengths, like figuring out from your professional and academic background, the things that you bring to the table is really important and highlighting those things. Um, let's talk, because I, I want to make sure there's time for questions, but let's talk about timing. I know right now we're in April. Some people, I know some of you have gotten acceptance letters for, you know, things that are starting this fall and maybe you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have funding. Let's talk a little bit about timing um, and, and applying to assistantships and other forms of graduate funding. What have you learned in your experience on that? Okay, so the, um, in general, um, you can apply for these at any time. You know, again, especially since a lot of these positions really don't exist, um, or if they do exist, they don't even have formal applications. So keep in mind that they're like at a large university, there will be hundreds, if not more of, you know, of these types of positions. But you'll notice that there are very, very, very few applications. So even in places that have like formally instituted positions, they don't have applications. They just kind of pick and choose who they want. Um, you know, a professor might have at the, some professors I know at the end of their classes for TAs, they'll just identify one or two students like, you know, you did very well in this class, you know, I'd like for you to be a TA, you know, whatever. Um, GRAs and GAs, they don't really do that. Um, they kind of, you know, they pick who they know or who comes up. Um, so like in my case, because I was coming into the institution, there was obviously no way that someone would just be like, hey, you know, you should be a GRA. I, I wasn't there. Um, I applied a full semester ahead. So I applied, um, I applied actually, I think the week after I got my acceptance letter, which was like January, it was 2015 or something like that. Um, and I applied for the, so that was spring, sorry. So the spring semester, I applied for the fall semester. So in January, I applied for August. Um, that's the most ideal, a full semester ahead because um, J December to January, most um, institutions, that's generally when they get their, um, uh, uh, their funding uh, for the following year. So that's when they know how much money they have versus the end of the year, which is when they're kind of like they're running out of their money. Um, you're still able to, again, like uh, everything after that is just, it kind of decreases in likelihood because at the same time as, um, you know, them not uh, having as good a grasp on their money or having just distributed that money. At the same time, other people are applying as well. So if you're applying around this time, you know, you, there's a lot of competition. You know, you're dealing with people who the professors already know. You're dealing with people who have applied since, you know, between January and what is it, April. In April. Um, so there's more competition. It's, it's more difficult. It's not as ideal, but it's certainly possible. There's, there's a student that I was, you know, that I'm working with right now that, um, that got one, you know, fairly quickly, but that's not the norm. It's not the norm to get a response in even a month, honestly. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really about like, again, it's, it's showing like how prepared you are. Um, so all in all, looking at it the same way as like, you know, like any like regular job, um, and applying it's, you know, like, uh, so there's a kind of question of, you know, when are you available or when do you, when do you need to come on site? The sooner you say that you need to, the less prepared you look. But again, it's not to say that it's impossible. It's just, it's kind of a range. It's not binary in terms of like, you know, will you get the job or won't you, or are you prepared or aren't you? It's, 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 uh, it's, you know, it's a scale. And so like, if you were like, if it were now and say you'd been admitted for August, um, you certainly could, you know, you certainly could apply. Um, you, you still want to, you know, recognize like the general processes and everything, but it's, um, one thing to recognize is like, I would estimate on average that you won't get responses. It, it would take between, I say like three to six weeks to get a response and six weeks or more, maybe even to get an interview. Um, I've certainly seen less, like mine was like, a month, I think, or something like three weeks, something like that. Um, there's been less, there's been more, but it's one, it's not a guarantee because they don't have to hire anyone, never mind you. Plus, you have the competition and you know, time constraints and all those kinds of things. So, um, most ideally, you'd want to apply a full um, regular semester ahead. Um, and that's whether you're in, that's whether you're at the college or not. Um, 
you know, and, you know, considering your schedule and all those other kinds of things. Um, it also lets you, yeah, because if you're, especially if you're applying a semester ahead, you haven't had, you don't have your schedule set already. It's not, it's probably not possible for you to have your schedule set. Um, so you don't have things set in stone. So you can kind of work your schedule around the job as opposed to telling the, you know, because if you're, if they're talking to you, it's like, okay, when are you available? And you say like, well, I'm only available Monday from nine to two and then Tuesday from 12 to one, it's you, you lose a lot of negotiating power that way, as opposed to saying like in my situation, which was like, well, I haven't set my schedule yet. So why don't you decide, you know, when you think that I'm, you know, you want me to be available and then I'll set my schedule because there's a bunch of different classes I can take. So I can set my schedule afterward. That's great. Um, okay, we got 15 minutes. I actually want to open the floor for some questions because we got some great insights from you, Jonathan. Um, there's a lot of people on this uh, Zoom link, and I'm sorry again about the YouTube live kind of going a little wacky, but um, if you would like to ask a question to Jonathan, if you could type it into the chat box, that would be great. Um, people might be able to raise hands too, but I'm just, uh, sometimes we get a lot of feedback with the this many people on, so. Feel free to um, type it into the chat box if you have a question for Jonathan. Uh, this takes a few minutes, or there's a bit of a delay. So I'm gonna ask you one last question, Jonathan, in the meantime. Um, just the one last bit of word of wisdom maybe before we go, go on to questions is like, what else have you learned as a graduate student that you wish you could pass on to, to those who are aspiring to enter master's doctoral programs? Anything else about the whole funding or the journey or what you wish you would have known? <laughs> Um, well, I'll say, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things. I think it's really, really, I mean, the only thing that I would say, like, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe that I would regret is not going directly into a PhD program. Um, but really marginally. And it was because I wasn't sure what, you know, PhDs, like, obviously, you know, like PhDs are much more intensive than masters. They're much longer and they're much more grueling. And I didn't want to put myself through a program when I wasn't sure exactly what, like the nature of the program. Cause like, you know, I, I kind of consider myself a little interdisciplinary. I do political science and government and economics and statistics. And, and I kind of felt that I could do a PhD in any of those, but I wasn't sure exactly which one. And so I think now in terms of like, you know, doing my master's for two years and then I look, it's like, just like, do I really want to spend like another like, four to seven years or whatever on a PhD. It's like, if I would have done the PhD, I would have got the master's already. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it's like, then I would like, you know, but it's, it's, it's not really a matter of like, you know, like regret. It's just, uh, it, it, I kind of look at it in just being like really, you know, inquisitive and, you know, inquiring about like the nature of programs and just being really sure because I'm sure you probably know better than I do. Um, people leave PhD programs after years with nothing. Um, and I certainly wouldn't want to be, you know, in that, you know, situation either, but at the same time, I still kind of think like, do I really want to spend like another four to seven years or whatever? Um, but yeah, I mean, it has helped me, it has helped me a lot. I'll say with this process with like, you know, fellowships and scholarships and all those kinds of things and looking at PhDs, um, and stuff for the future, which I, I didn't tell you, but I'm actually going to be applying in December or the October to December period. Um, for mine, so I'll be in like the same boat as a lot of the people oh, here. <laughs> um, and now you know where to find the funding. So, yeah. <laughs> Wait, we got questions coming in. So um, maybe, uh, and I'd like to get as many of these as we can. So um, first one is, how do you develop and sustain relationships with professors as an applicant to the university? Did you talk to any professors in advance? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and also because the kind of the same way that I was just saying, I talked to different professors in different programs because I wasn't sure which one I wanted to apply for at first, but it really helped me apply. Um, uh, developing relationships, it's, I mean, it's really about being intentional. I would say professors will figure out really quickly, just people in general, will figure out really quickly if you're trying to develop a relationship with them for a very, very specific purpose. Um, I reached, I basically, I looked through faculty listing of colleges that I was interested in applying to, and I looked at the research and background of professors, and I saw like, okay, this professor does this, I'm interested in doing that, I want to learn more about that, you know, I would send an email, and it's like, you know, doctor, blah, 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 I read your research on this and that, you know, it would be great if we'd be able to talk sometime, or, you know, I'll be in Austin or New York or whatever college it is. I'll be there, you know, for this week. It'd be great if I could meet and chat with you a little bit about your research. You know, also I'm applying to the university like next fall or whatever. Um, and, you know, it'd be great if I could get some insight. 
and then just kind of, you know, maintaining that relationship, like you would maintain like any, you know, relationship. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to say there's like really a strategy because I feel like the more you strategize in that way, the less um, genuine it seems. So really it's just kind of like, what I'll say is like um, professors are often, more often than not flattered that you're interested in their research. Um, their whole career, they spent years or decades doing very, very like intricate and minute studies. And I say even for me, and I'm definitely not a PhD, I wonder sometimes like, does my research matter? Like do people care about like what I do? Right. Um, it's, it's, you'll, you'll get more good responses than you won't um, when you, um, when you make those, those contacts and those relationships. It is important to know who's in charge of things um, because there are, you know, there are professors that are on the committees for admissions, they're on committees for scholarships and fellowships and stuff like that. I've never targeted any of those people specifically because I just wasn't necessarily interested in their research, um, or at least that I know of. Sometimes there's like hidden committees, but um, at least that I know of, but they do talk to each other. So that's, that's something to, you know, to think about is you know, they do talk to each other. Yeah, and I just want to add to that. If this is particularly important for when you're applying to doctoral programs. I think this is even more common than for people applying to masters, uh, making those contacts with the um, professors because you'll have a like a key supervisor when you're doing your doctorate, and um, often you have to say in your application who you would like, what potential supervisors are you interested in. Developing those relationships during your application process, um, you know, ha will have the they'll influence for you behind the scenes if you develop relationship but I love what you said about being strategic looking at the research mentioning that in your email so not just a generic thing that you read on their like one web page like you can look into Google Scholar see what they've written and uh, you'll ideally then work with somebody that you know is doing research in an area that you're really interested in mm -hmm. I do want to mention something that I should have mentioned much earlier um, a, a, the most competitive fellowships at universities um, so you'll have fellowships at universities Okay, well, let me break it down. So you have outside fellowships from like Ford Fellowship and National Institute of Health and National Science Foundation, you have all those. Um, universities themselves will have um, the university level fellowships, which are basically fellowships that anyone at any college can get. And they're very competitive. They'll usually give out like maybe a dozen a year. Mm -hmm. And then your college, like say the College of Law or the College of Engineering or whatever, they'll give out fellowships and stuff too. And the higher you go, basically, you know, the more prestigious and the more that they are. You know, stuff like that. Um, one thing to keep in mind with those is that the most prestigious fellowships at colleges and universities, you have to be recommended by a professor at the university. And sometimes those recommendations are due either, um, sometimes those recommendations are due before your application, which if you didn't develop relationships with your professors, the, the, you're just not going to get them. It's just, it's, it's too late. Um, so like for mine, the application was due like December 15th and you had to be recommended for the fellowship, I think October 15th. Um, and so again, like if you're just kind of taking a really, really traditional approach of just, you know, being really passive and just applying and, you know, you might get in, but you won't get that fellowship because you had to have been recommended before the application was due, which means you were literally required to have developed relationships with professors. Oh, this is really smart. <laughs> um, so you have to keep that in mind. And that's, it's another thing where it's like, the, the, the general thing is you're not going to figure out everything. Um, you, you're not going to find all of the scholarships and all of the fellowships. I feel like I know a lot and I still learn new things every day, even about my own institutions. Um, the, the best rule of thumb is to, like developing those relationships, you know, being sincere, being strategic. And often they'll tell you, you know, like you'll have like a relationship with like say some professor and they'll be like, oh, do you know about this fellowship? I think you'd be great for it. Would you like for me to recommend you for it? Um, if you didn't have that relationship up, you might just not have known about it. Mm. Okay, let me take another question. What skills have you seen that are the most competitive for research? Qualitative, data cleaning, data analysis, programming, et cetera. Um, does it matter or does it depend on the center or type of research that's being done? Yeah, like it, absolutely, it, ab it absolutely depends. I mean, um, it, 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 because the centers are so individualistic and specific like quantitative skills aren't going to help you at the law school um, for the most part and qualitative skills aren't going to help you in the biological sciences like it absolutely depends on what program um, and center so like um, say like for and I, I used I just say UT because that's where I went and that's where I know you know more specifically although a lot of the stuff really applies So like UT for example there's a list of centers there's 52 centers at the University of Texas 
and they range anywhere from engineering to biological sciences to political science, policy, sociology. And so there's, there's, not, a, there's not a one size fits all answer. In the same way that we are kind of talking about before, it depends absolutely on what you're applying to. You might have, um, say, professors specifically whose expertise is in you know, qualitative um, anthropological research um, in which quantitative skills won't necessarily help you. Um, maybe it'll help with a specific piece of research that they're doing. But it even like, just the nature of research is that it's so, so specific. So maybe uh, there is a mixed methods, you know, research or something that someone's doing, which is mostly qualitative. Maybe they need one person that's quantitative on it. Maybe they don't. Um, it absolutely depends. So there's, there's no one size fits all answer. I mean, I guess if I'm thinking the most broadly, quantitative skills will probably get you a job faster. But again, it's still very specific to what that job is. Mm -hmm. Okay, good question. Um, someone else wrote, hi, Jonathan, thank you for sharing your experience as a graduate research assistant. Um, could you review a breakdown of how you're funding your tuition fellowship? You said tuition fellowship, maybe you just mean your tuition. Sure, so, if, if I understand correctly. Um, well, I'll just say like, so my awards, basically, I guess. The awards that I, the awards that I came in, and I did receive a couple of awards. They weren't fellowships, but they were like scholarships that, um, after I was already in because I, I don't stop applying for things until people tell me I can't. Like if you <laughs> tell me that I can't get any more money, it's like, okay, fine. Well, first of all, show it to me where it's written first. <laughs> but aside from that, I'm not going to stop applying for things. Um, so I came in with a McNair fellow, a National McNair Fellowship, which you're, you can only be eligible for if you participated in it in undergrad. So you had to be at a university that had it. But say for my case, um, the University of Texas was a partner or is a partner of the, the National McNair Fellowship Program. So it paid for my tuition, it paid for health care, and it paid a stipend of, I think, 36000 a year. Yeah, 36000 a year, I think is what it was. I forget. Um, so that's, you know, that's what that was. And then like my research assistantship would also pay for tuition, but they didn't have to. So they just paid me, you know, they just paid me a stipend, like a, like a job essentially, um, which is effectively comes down to a salary. It's a, it's a salaried job. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's pretty much how it was, you know, for me. Yeah. So that, that McNair fellowship, again, you have to be eligible for it. Uh, it you have to be at a university as an undergrad and be eligible, you know, in undergrad. So, so probably most of us wouldn't be eligible for that, but there are fellowships that, that you can look for as an undergrad that will help fund graduate school. Mm -hmm. Be on the lookout for those in the Profella database. Um, right. And I'll just, how, I'll how do you see other people do it? Like, how do they cover their tuition? Do the, do the assistantships generally cover the full tuition? When yeah, so, so the way, and it, it, does, it does vary. And you know, I always preface by saying, this is generally how I operate to tier one universities. Tier one universities, in the ones that, that have money. So if you, look, if you look up a list of the top 200 um, most funded universities in the country, those are pretty much tier one, um, tier one universities. Um, and so basically any university that has a billion dollars or more, like, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. kind of like a, a floor of looking at it because um, like, let's say that the University of Houston, for example, in Texas, um, they'll pay for your tuition up to a certain point. And I imagine the reason they do that is because um, MBA programs and like engineering programs, stuff like that, they cost more than others. So they don't want to get caught up with all of those costs. Um, whereas say like, you know, tier one universities, like say like university of Texas and Berkeley and Georgia and like those that I gave example, they don't really care how much it is because it's their own university. It's like they can afford the cost of their own, you know, their own, their own institution. Um, so for most of those, it doesn't, it does, it doesn't matter to them. Um, you know, what the cost is, but it does vary. Like in the easiest way, all you have to do is just look up the policies of the university. If you just look up graduate um, assistantship, University of whatever, Hawaii, whatever it is, um, it'll tell you, it'll tell you exactly what their policies are. It'll say whether it pays in full, whether it pays up to a certain amount. Um, I know it's some universities, I don't remember them by name, some universities, it'll only pay tuition and it won't necessarily pay you a stipend. So there is some, there is some variation. Um, but the general rule and the preface that I, that I operate by is tier one universities um, will pay for, you know, full tuition and a stipend of some amount, um, you know, that varies. Hmm. Here's, here's actually another good question. Um, I'm wondering if um, your assistantship, your graduate research assistantship rolled over each semester or was it a fixed term? Like, was it only just for one year and then you had to renegotiate it or? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so um, yes, so graduate uh, graduate assistantships, um, they are they're always um, for a particular term, and it's whatever the term is you agree on. But the maximum is a year, and so um, if you agree on say like just a summer or just a spring or just a fall, then you know that's what it is, and it can be renewed, but it's at their discretion. Um, the maximum term is a year. So mine was mine was for a year. And then they asked me at the end if I wanted to renew, um, you know, which I did in which there's no, there was no process. I didn't have to do anything. It was just basically, you know, they just took me on for another year. It was like, it was kind of like, I don't know, applying, I guess, taking another class in terms of the process. There wasn't anything I really had to do. Um, but they are always for a year. So there's not a guarantee you're going to be rehired. Of course, just like any job, there's not a guarantee you're going to keep that job. You know, they might not like you halfway through, who knows? Um, but yeah, for the most part, they're, they're for a year. PhD programs are different, and I'm not going to explain that because I'm not a PhD. Um, sometimes they'll have like guarantees for jobs as long as you're, you know, in the program for TAs and stuff like that. But um, in general, those um, GRAs, TAs and stuff, well, TAs are different actually because they're classes. So those are often by semester because they're literal, you know, semester by semester classes. But um, GRAs and GAs, in my experience, um, the contract term has been for about a year. Okay. But you, actually, what I will say is you do often have to negotiate summer because they're not usually thinking about summer. Um, sometimes centers don't even operate in the summer. You have to, you have to keep in mind that. Um, some only operate during the, you know, the academic fall and spring academic year. Mine did operate in the summer. Um, some don't. Again, like it's, there's general rules around this stuff, but you do really have to investigate um, the centers, institutes, professors, classes, like individually. There's not a one size fits all. Oh, that's really smart to know. The good thing point about the summer, um, and, and some students do, they'll get a summer fellowship or summer job mm -hmm. if they're not covered in the summer with a stipend. So mm -hmm. that's a good I have one last good question that we can do before the hour's up. Um, what advice would you have for college grads to identify and accumulate relevant experiences towards a graduate degree? Uh, this is kind of a gap year question, but also a question about how to tell your story. So I guess if you're going, you know, or applying to graduate school, what experiences should you highlight? What should you try to get if you don't already have them? Sure. So obviously that's specific to the kind of programs and stuff you're applying to. One thing that I'll say, what, what, um, it wasn't quite asking the question, but I think, I think it, it relates to the question. One thing that was really helpful for me is I was up front with my employer who I also worked for an undergrad and I basically got a promotion like after I graduated. I was really upfront with them that I'm gonna work here for two more years and then I'm applying to graduate school. I'm just letting you know that right now because at some point I'm gonna be like visiting, you know, colleges and universities and stuff like that. And, you know, and they were really supportive of it because in order to be really competitive, like I kind of talked about is you need to visit colleges, you need to, you know, develop these relationships, you know, make contacts, travel preferably if you can. Um, and a lot of employers aren't necessarily up to the task with that. A lot are, you know, it's like, well, this, you know, that's that, and this is this, um, that has nothing to do with us. Um, so I was able to travel, you know, I was able to, you know, develop these relationships. They're really supportive. They provided, you know, recommendations and things like that. I think that's really key is finding, if, you're, if your intent is for a gap year, I would say the most important thing is to develop a plan of how long that gap year is. I've run into a lot of, you know, like friends and people in general that are like, I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to take some time off. It's like, well, how much time off? It's like, well, I don't know. And then like five years later, they're still, you know, working, which isn't bad, but it, it kind of shows that if you don't have a plan, you're just going to kind of, you're, you're, it's, it's probably not going to happen as likely. Whereas mine was, again, I told my employer, it's like, I'm going to be here two years, exactly two years. And then I'm gone. Um, you know, like, okay, well, that's fine. You know, let's get all these things situated now. Um, but in terms of like preparing, um, it does, it in part depends on the kind of program that you're applying to. If it's academic program, you, you want to be able to develop, um, publishable or published research in the meantime. Um, if it's a professional program, you want to develop those professional skills, um, that are applicable. So like my program being, you know, policy, I, I develop like, you know, policy, um, oriented, uh, skills and program management skills and certifications and things like that. So professional programs will are more concerned with things like certifications and professional skills, whereas academic programs are more concerned with publishable or published materials. So it kind of depends in that way. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, broadly what I would say in relate to that. That's awesome. All right, Jonathan, any last words for the aspiring uh, graduate students in this audience? Um, I would just say be really, really diligent. I... I treated it like, and I always tell people to treat it like 
the, the search for getting funding for your graduate education is a job in, in and of itself. Um, and so you have to make time for it. It's not something that you can just spend a couple minutes a day if you really want to get funded. Because um, like when you look at it in the grand scheme of things, especially for PhDs, but even for masters, it's like we're talking about tens or potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars that if you spend the time um, and, you know, the resources and make the connections that you can potentially have entirely paid off or even, you know, if you're lucky, have them pay you. And so if you look at it just from an economic sense, um, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for what I probably consider to be a couple dozen hours is a, is a very good return on investment. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much. I just want to let everyone know I'm going to have a recording of this available on the, uh, the YouTube channel once it's processed and up. And um, Jonathan, I hope we can, um, I'm also going to try to get an article up on this so that people can keep posting questions and uh, stay in contact. But thank you so much for taking the time with us today to really share your experience and give us some good ideas. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you to everyone that was on the link. And um, I'll send out a, a link to this from, from where, when it's on YouTube. You can also subscribe to YouTube and find it there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.